Chapter 1. <clears throat> Communication is possible. Seek and ye shall find. Jesus. It is unlikely that the truth about flying saucers will reach the public through governmental agencies. The reason for this is not to be found in any malicious desire to conceal the truth, but simply in the fact that neither the governments nor any individuals know the truth about the UFO. This book is positively not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about the UFO, but it does bring forward to the public consideration certain truths about the UFO that will help build a larger mosaic. The truths about certain of the UFO herein revealed were obtained the hard way and involved considerable expenditure of time and money as well as some risk. The starting point of all that this book contains is that the truth belongs to those who seek it. On the wise principle of seek and ye shall find, Seeking is not for the timid, since for each thing that is found, one can count on running down many blind alleys first. Early in my UFO studies, I concluded that officialdom throughout the world was hopelessly at sea over the whole UFO phenomenon, and that its evidential Evidential aspects were so completely beyond conventional science that an ordinary man like myself might have as good a chance of penetrating the mystery as anyone else. Existing theories about life, matter, physical laws, and propulsion are likely to prove nothing more than a very rough guide in getting at the truth of the UFO for reasons which we shall presently discuss. A lack of formal scientific training is nowhere near as severe a handicap as per blind devotion to existing theories. One investigation of the UFO is being undertaken by an individual or a group. This is my opinion, formed after many months of investigation. The latter day advent of the UFO was regarded by me as being definite proof of my lifelong belief that intelligent life does exist elsewhere in the universe a belief which astrophysicists, astronomers, and even ordinary medical doctors increasingly share with esoteric philosophers who have never believed anything else. For generations, however, astronomical theory had held life could not exist here or there or elsewhere in the universe because certain conditions had not been fulfilled. These mechanistic concepts have pretty well gone by the board in recent years, for there is no other valid explanation for the presence of the UFO than that. There is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, one at a time, and usually after contact with UFO data, astronomers are getting on the life on other worlds bandwagon, leaving only a few diehards to pound away with the calcified theories of yesteryear. Astronomy has been seeking to get off the hook because it is an observational science and the observational evidence now available of intelligent life elsewhere is so overpowering that the old theories are untenable. The activity of the moon, for example, indicating physical structures being erected, finally puts the hammer on the honored theory that the moon is a dead ball of matter in the heavens. Thus, observation, the evidential flail, the astronomer has laid on the theories of others in the past is now being used by intelligent persons to beat the life out of some of the most dearly beloved theories in science. Flying saucers, the UFO, by observation, both electronic and visual, are fight accompli, and arguments as to whether they do exist or not are idle, time-wasting, and an obstacle to further investigation get down to the discussion of the queries. Where do they come from? What are they? And what do they want? And the less actively pursued question, what is the nature of their reality? Like almost everyone else, my own interest followed routine channels, which included the books of Kehoe, Cramp, Wilkins, Jessup, Adamski, and others. Again, like almost everyone else, I found the variation of viewpoints to be very wide, and the confusion tremendous in these standard books on the subject. 
the interpretations placed upon the observed phenomena also differed wild, widely. Each of the saucer writers seemed to have pet personality, seemed to have pet personal theories regarding the UFO into which he sought to press the facts. In a couple of years of study, I frankly did not know whether I was coming or going. Were the UFO friendly or hostile? Were they manned by humans like us or a different type of being? These questions and others still puzzle almost every UFO student and enthusiast, and most of them remain unanswered. The point of departure for me with standard UFO writings came over the question of communication with these UFO and contact with the occupants of the craft, if indeed they were craft at all. The reason I believe that communication must be possible with the craft was that in rather extensive travels around the world, I had noted that civilization in every country was directly proportional to communications development. The reason I had paid attention to communications development was that I was, at the time of my journeyings, a radio officer in the British Merchant Navy. In parts of the Orient and Middle East, a telephone is still a very rare instrument, if you can find one. A call to point a call to a point a hundred miles away may take a day or two or you might never get it. Telegraph communications are scanty and radio almost non existent. One reaches bottom where communication is concerned in those proportions. One reaches bottom where communication is concerned in those portions of Africa where the tree trunk drum or the human runner still serve as the means. In these locales, material civilization is at its most retarded. This fact of communications as the index of civilization is not widely appreciated in the United States, where through habit we speak, write, and project the human image over thousands of miles with a familiarity bound to breed contempt for it. Far from being happy with our communications, including radio and television and their exquisite refinements, manufacturers are driven to improve and expand their services by relentless competitive pressure for improved ability to communicate. The ability to communicate on a worldwide scale and a variety of media is available to every American, and in this country we have the highest material civilization known on this planet. It is obvious from their observed speeds and maneuvers, their advanced propulsion systems as now acknowledged, their ability to appear and disappear, that the UFO are undeniably products of a civilization immeasurably advanced beyond our own, technologically speaking. While we boast in our newspapers of airplanes capable of 1,500 miles per hour other craft, perhaps not of this world, have been electronically measured traveling six times this speed and more in our atmosphere. In my view, it is irrational to admit the existence of such advanced vehicles and then deny to their occupants the ability to communicate on a scale far beyond anything we now have. If communication is the handmaiden of technological progress, as is the case in our own earthly civilization, it is logical to assume that it will be true of other worlds. We must accept that the intelligences occupying or directing these strange craft will have mastery of all methods of communication, including all that we now have on Earth and perhaps many systems that we could not comprehend. They may look upon our radio as humorously primitive and regard our best radar and electronic detection apparatus as infantile. We must also not forget that they may have developed natural communication methods to a high degree, since all that we have in the way of communications is nothing more than the externalization of the contents of our minds. The radio transmitter was conceived in the mind of a man, then externalized, that is, fabricated. In a sense, the radio transmitter is nothing more than materialized thought. Communication engineers who vault upon their high horses when these concepts are advanced would do well to review the very short history of electronic communication on this planet. 
there are living humans today who were grown men and women before radio in any form was known. Let that reminder suffice for expanding egos. My own viewpoint at the time I began my investigations was that the probability was very great that these UFO beings would have communication methods as far beyond ours as those of modern America or beyond the tree trunk drum. I have found nothing subsequently to nullify this viewpoint and overwhelmingly evidence that is the case. In the light of the above reasoning, I found it absurd that so many otherwise able and intelligent men writing on the UFO could be so adamant in saying that there had been no communication with the saucer beings. On the one hand, as ufologists and saucer proselytizers, they recognized the presence in the atmosphere of the products of an advanced civilization, while on the other, they virtually denied the contro controlling intelligences any, in any ability in communication. The most unfortunate part of this viewpoint is that it was, is that it was and is held today without investigation. Investigation will reveal the theory to be false. For myself, I sought to become as a little child by sweeping out of my mind accumulations of dogma and prejudice. I began by placing myself in the position of the UFO beings and wondered what my course of action would be if I wanted to contact humans on the surface of the earth. Could I, for example, go straight to the President of the United States? I felt that this would not be feasible. For the moment, the president met with his advisors and told them a space being had communicated with him. The conclusion would doubtless be drawn that the pressure of the job had unhinged his mind. The same applies to all top government officials. Science, in the orthodox sense, would, ha would also have to be counted out quickly. All that dogma, all those misconceptions, all those brilliant minds banged, barred, and bolted against anything radical. The UFO being might reason that this type of mind, which has been the major obstacle to innovation since the time of Galileo, is the poorest possible soil for new cosmic ideas. It seemed to me that the UFO beings would finally be compelled to start at the bottom and work up rather than at the top and work down. Working from the top down is the system favored by some people, but I consider that the UFO beings would have no choice but to get down to the grassroots and slowly let their presence, purposes, and ability to communicate seep through the general population. By this means, governments would finally be forced to take cognizance of the claims, especially if the lower orders of us humans of us human beings were given information that would eventually be proven true. It was in this way that I came to visit Giant Rock, California, a desert air trip in an isolated spot between Victorville and Twenty Nine Palms, with a long history as a landing ground for aliens in pre war days and as a burial ground for Indians in pre pale face days. Giant Rock is difficult to access over dirt roads that try the springs of the stoutest automobile. A dry lake bed and a shingle airstrip run uphill to the foot of the giant rock, a 70-foot high boulder with enormous girth. Behind the rock is a 400-foot high pile of smooth round boulders. In this arid flinty locale, there dwells a man who seems to harmonize with his environment. Middle-aged with the sandy, thinning hair, George Van Tassel is one of the pioneers of communication with the UFO. Communication? No radio towers or antenna or electronic equipment clutter the area, for communication is carried on by telepathy or thought transference. This skill known to and used by the ancients and basically possessed by every human being, is one of the God-given faculties. It has atrophied in most of us through centuries of non-use. 
Beneath the giant rock, a large chamber has been hewn from the ground and furnished with chairs and tables. From this room, Mr. Van Tassel carries out his communications with the saucer beings. In complete darkness, in this cavern under the giant rock, and after preparatory measures closely resembling those of a seance, there booms forth from Van Tassel's direction a voice that is most definitely not his own. I am Holda. Your people will soon witness more fireballs, which we are dropping as nullifiers. Greetings of love and peace to you. More messages follow in voices which vary in accent, in timber, in a manner that would be beyond the ability of even the most talented actor. These discourses deal with a variety of subjects, including life on other planets, UFO propulsion, and always with atomic power. In my view, the entities speaking through Van Tassel were of a standard intelligence far beyond his own. This is not intended to be derogatory to Mr. Van Tassel, who, while a likable personality, is not a highly educated man and does not claim to be such. These entities speak with a grammar and exhibit sentence construction and a vocabulary far beyond Mr. Van Tassel's attainments in these fields. The use of Mr. Van Tassel's personal physical facilities for these beings to manifest indicates that they are able to manifest here on Earth only through the agency of suitable humans. Although this is not yet entirely proven, Mr. Van Tassel is willing enough to give an earnest seeker the method of preparing oneself for this type of contact. He told me when I asked him and made no claims for patent rights or special talent. He did not warn of possible ill effects, but fired with enthusiasm. I paid his cautioning little heed. In the light of my own later experiences with telepathy, I do not consider it wise to dispense the information regarding preparation for it to all and sundry. It can be dangerous, and there are those who will dabble in these things who are totally unprepared for such activity. I know because I was just that type of person myself. Having asked for what I got, I have no complaints, but I will not myself be responsible for dispensing the same information to others and hence exclude it from this text. Mr. Van Tassel has no racket or gimmick at the giant rock. He has nothing to sell, and together with his family and associates, appears dedicated to further work in the UFO field. The idea that he is cleaning up financially with his tiny cafe, often broached by UFO writers who have never been there, is fatuous. I would like it understood that while I am more than glad to pay appropriate tribute to George Van Tassel for his part in my early experiences, I do not necessarily agree with him today regarding the UFO, nor do I support his projected political ventures. In the months that followed, I sought contact consistently. As an investigator, I felt this was the only fair way to test the suggestions Mr. Van Tassel had given me. Until I had, I was in no position to pass judgment on this contact business. Like all applications of Spiritual science investigation inevitably involves participation. One cannot afford the luxuries of the onlooker consciousness, nor stand the penalties its misconceptions inflict upon spiritual growth. One participates, one experiences, and then one knows. The truth is within the one who has had the experience, and it may not be contradicted or negated, not by high-domed pontiff, but by atheistic scientists, nor by military officers active or retired. There is only one way to test the validity of UFO communication, and that is to try it. He who has not tried it is not qualified to render judgments on its possibilities or probabilities. The months slipped past without any results of any kind. However, I resolved that I would persist for a minimum period of six months, discouraged or not. Any other attitude would have been unfair and inconclusive. I continue to study the UFO, of course, seeking to find the central theme of coherence that would make the pieces fit. One night, at about 10 o'clock, I was reading Kehoe's Flying Saucer Conspiracy, with some care to details of one particular chapter. Suddenly, I was seized by an overpowering impulse, which I now realize was a tremendous thought impression, to pick up a pen and write. 
Obeying the impulse, I picked up a pencil and began writing on the cover of a paperback book. The only thing handy on which I could make a mark. My arm was impelled and controlled by an unseen force, and I wrote a scrawl which was largely unintelligible across the back of the book. At the bottom of the cover, I distinctly wrote the word discontinue, at which time the force on my arm was released just as though a switch had been thrown. I discussed this happening with my wife, who was somewhat startled. I stood in the middle of the floor, gesticulating and giving vent to my amazement when a similar force was exerted upon my head, drawing it upwards and backwards with surprising power. By a great effort of will, I was able to return my head to the normal position. The moment I seized willing it there, the force drew it upwards and backwards once more. Suddenly, as before, the force cut off as though switched, and my puzzlement was now doubled. I discussed it briefly with my wife, and a few minutes later had an overwhelming desire to go outside. Not wishing to further alarm my wife, I made the excuse that I had to go outside and move the car. As I moved to the door, my right hand rose to the knob by this self-same force and closed around it. Once again, I could will it to my side. I turned my body slightly so that the left hand was nearer to the knob and it too rose and grasped the knob without any conscious effort on my part. I went outside and descended the stairs. Immediately upon reaching the bottom of the stairs, the force seized upon my whole body, and I was propelled like a mechanical man down the street, halting at the corner. My body was spun around in a neat military right turn, and I walked to the end of the block. Here again I was stopped, spun in yet another right turn, and propelled in this same manner right around the block, returning to the entrance to my apartment. The force, once again, was removed as though it had been switched off. Inside, I thought deeply about this entire process, not knowing what to conclude, since no communication of any kind had reached me other than the unintelligible scrawl on the book cover. All I could think was that this had been some kind of test today. Of course, I look upon it as nothing more or less than an attempt to gain complete control of me with disaster averted only by my absolute inflexible resolve to remain master in my own house. After a while, I went to bed. Hardly in bed five minutes, I suddenly found my entire vocal mechanism functioning involuntarily, and through it, intelligent words and phrases were being conveyed to me. I did not hear voices, either at this time or at any other subsequent time, but rather listened to my own speech mechanism, which was being used as the agency to communicate with me. The message, as, I, as best I can recall, went something like this. I am Ashtar. I greet you from Sher, Shuri. Your interest in our cause is well known, and we would like you to help us. Would you be willing to do so? The message then conveyed some intelligence to me concerning a theory of mine on the UFO, which proved my theory both incorrect and potentially dangerous to me. I therefore felt that this initial communication containing such a warning with intimate knowledge of the subject concern was indeed genuine. However, I was still greatly disturbed by the entire happening. Even though I had sought to make contact with more than a little devotion, I had the inner feeling that all might not be what it seemed. Because of this, I sought out a kind gentleman, greatly learned in occult matters, and related my experience to him. From this man, I obtained certain secret information concerning the protection of one's self during telepathic contact, since all who seek to contact one by telepathy may not be spacemen. This, my first contact with the world outside the purely physical, was a jolt to me. Reared in Christian science, I was not prepared for any of these things, and least of all for the concept of aggressive forces in the unseen worlds. These few vital minutes with this remarkable man were probably the most important of my life. Without the advice I received and the knowledge to which I was made partly in my need, I would no doubt have been in serious danger. At this point, as I see it now, although I could not see it then, I was about half ready.